Children, <laughs> you upstairs. <laughs> How many of you are there? There's a husband and wife who are discussing possible, the possibility of taking a trip to the Holy Land on vacation. And the husband said, honey, wouldn't it be just fantastic to go to the Holy Land and stand and shout the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai? The wife said, well, I think it'd be better if we just stayed home and kept them. <laughs> well, it's got a point there. You know, over the last few weeks, we've, we've heard about hearing God's voice. We've talked about a crisis of belief, which is when we feel like we're being told to do something and we have to decide, do I actually believe what God has said about himself? Do I actually believe that God will prove his character in my life? Do I have this, the faith to, to step into that obedience? We've talked about how we need to make major adjustments to our lives in order to follow God where he's called us. And we talked about last week, and let's be honest, any adjustment always seems like a major adjustment at the time, doesn't it? But today we're going to talk about obedience. After we've heard God's voice, after we've had the crisis of belief, after we've made those adjustments, then actually taking that step into obedience. And obedience, let's be honest, can be the trickiest part of the whole thing, can it? I mean, it does no good to hear God's voice if we don't then obey God's voice, amen? amen. And sometimes, if we feel like we're not hearing God's voice, Sometimes it might be because maybe we haven't been obedient in the past. And so we lose the ability to hear what he's saying to us day to day. Obedience can be difficult. Now, why is obedience difficult? Well, there's three reasons I think that obedience can be difficult. First of all, it goes against our preferences, right? It's tough to obey because, let's be honest, we'd rather not do it sometimes. Why is it that kids don't clean their rooms? The first four times you tell them to. Because they don't want to, right? Why is it that maybe we don't eat or work out the way that we should? Because we'd rather not, right? We like that second helping. And as I talked about last week, I'm too lazy to jog. The, the truth is, most of the time, if we really wanted to do something, we'd already be doing it, right? That's maybe why we don't obey sometimes. It goes against our preferences. There could be lots of reasons maybe why it goes against our preferences, right? Like if, in the story of Jonah, why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh when God said go to Nineveh? Racism, right? He didn't like the Ninevites. He didn't like the Assyrians. They were the mortal enemy of Israel. It was racial hatred. And as he said, this is a Jonah uh, chapter 4 Verse 2. Oops. I'm wrong marker here. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. So, so Jonah has heard from God. He said, no, I'm going to go the other way. He's been swallowed by a fish. The fish spits him up. And Jonah says, okay, I will now go to Nineveh. He goes and preaches in Nineveh. What happens? Oh, they repent. And God spares them from judgment. And this is, Jonah's a good Study and doing the right thing for the wrong reason with the wrong heart. It is possible. Because, like, he, Jonah's story could have been so incredible, but instead he just kind of has a bad attitude to the whole thing. And this is what he says uh, I, Jonah chapter 4, verse 2 says, He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. What was he saying? I didn't want to go to Nineveh because I know that you are a good and faithful and compassionate God, and if they repented of their sin, you wouldn't destroy them. And I wanted to see them all burn. That's what he's dealing with. He didn't want... He, 
He didn't want to go to Nineveh. It was definitely against his preference. He would have rather seen his mortal enemies die. Right? Now, hopefully, that's not something that we're struggling with, but, but when it comes to when God says do this, when we know we're supposed to do something, let's, there's going to be a lot of reasons we just, eh, I'd rather not. Second reason that we may not obey when, we meet, when we're supposed to is that maybe it exposes us to potential failure, right? Like if I try this thing, what if it doesn't work out? Do we like to fail? No, I don't like to fail. None of us like to fail. See, it's not that you, we usually doubt God's abilities, right? He's God. He can do anything. He can accomplish anything he sets his mind to. Really, a lot of times it's us that we doubt. Like, do we, can, am I actually able to do the things that God is asking me to do? It's us that we don't trust. But by then not obeying, essentially what we're doing is we are trusting in ourselves, right? We're trusting in our own abilities. And I don't have the ability to get this done, so it's not going to get done, and I'm going to fail. Instead of trusting that God is going to use us as he says he will, because he's faithful to his promises, and he will not let us down. You know, we, we can't fail if we don't try, so we don't try, so we don't fail, and we give God, we, we miss an opportunity for God to do things through us that reveal his glory and allow people to come to know him more intimately, including us, because we've gone through the experience of seeing God use us in a way that we never thought we could be used. It exposes us to possible failures so we maybe not, we don't try. The third reason that we may find obedience difficult is that it stretches us beyond our experiences. It stretches us beyond our experiences. Now, this is kind of the flip side of that second one, right? And where it exposes us to possible failure, and we're saying, I can't possibly do this. Well, sometimes, instead of being afraid of our weaknesses, what we're really doing is we're trusting in our strength. We, we trust in what we know. And well, I've never experienced this before, and I trust my experience. I trust what I can see and perceive with my senses. And I'm not sure how this is all going to work out. And if I can't predict it, I'm not willing to try it. it it's, it's stretching me beyond what I'm willing to go. It takes us beyond our ability to trust in our knowledge and our experience. But you know, as you read through Scripture, what you find is that God does some of his greatest work through people that don't have a clue what they're doing. Have you read the story of Moses before? Like, at every turn, he's like, I don't know what to do. And he calls out to God, and God says, just do this, and he does. Just say this, and he does. Just, just hit that rock. Okay, I can hit a rock, I suppose. Lift your staff over the water, and the seas part and goes through. So many times Moses didn't really know what he was doing, but he did know God, and God said, you just obey my voice, and you do what I tell you to do, and everything's going to be fine. Gideon, the story of Gideon is, is amazing, because he just, he doesn't believe, he do, definitely doesn't trust in himself. He doesn't think he can do it, which is a good starting place, by the way, when we're trying to walk with God, is understanding that we can do it. Great, that means you have to trust in God to do it. But he didn't know what he was doing, and God worked it all out. Then even in the New Testament, when you look at Paul's story, uh, in, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul, now Paul was somebody that before he came to Christ, he did think he knew what he was doing, right? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was raised the right way. He had total confidence in his interpretation of the law and his own ability to be righteous by the way that he lived, and he knew it. He knew what he was doing, and then God had to say, you know what, I'm just stripping all that away. I don't want you to know what you're doing. This is what uh, Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. What is Paul saying there? All the things I used to trust in, my own knowledge, my own experience, my own interpretations, my own theories, all out the window. All I want now is Jesus, and all I have now is Jesus. All I want to know is Christ. So everything else, I'm just throwing away. 
we are called to obey. And the primary text for today is in uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. Which is an interesting parable because I believe I'm accurate to say that it's not found in the other Gospels. It's called the parable of the two sons. And before I read it, a little background about this passage is it's in a larger section of scripture that takes place the week that Christ is crucified. So this story takes place the Monday after Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, Christ rides in, he's on the donkey, people are throwing down their coats, people are throwing down their the palm branches, they're saying, hail to the king, uh, blessed is, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All celebration, but Jesus knows what's going to happen on Friday. And that whole week, his teaching is different from most of his teaching. It has a certain flavor to it that essentially is full of warnings and last chances to the people of Israel. In this week is when Christ went, goes in and he overturns the, uh, the tables in the temple, right? Uh, he curses the fig tree, which is kind of a, a living parable of what's going to happen to the nation of Israel if they do not put their, their faith in him. He taught, uh, there's parables about the wedding feast, parable of the ten virgins, the five wise ones, the five foolish ones that weren't ready when it was longer before the master came back, before the, the groom came. The, the parable of the talents, which of course you know, gives one guy five and one, another one two. And, you know, how are you going to use the gifts that God has given you? Um, the sheep and the goats. And then also Jesus teaches about the end times. All of the teaching in this week has a, a, a sense about it of this is last chance. What are you going to do? Any takers? You're going to follow me? You're going to not follow me? Because there's real consequences. And so we come to, to verse 28. Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go to work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the, the, to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. And we'll stop there for just a minute. Two sons. First one says, not doing it, Dad. Not going. That makes parents unhappy, doesn't it? <laughs> you say to your kid, do this. And they say, no. It doesn't make us happy. And he, I mean, he didn't even do the thing, you know, where he just pretends like he didn't hear. Your kids never did that, right? Pretend like they didn't hear. He doesn't even do that. He says, no, Dad, I'm not doing it. Maybe there was other language that came out too. I don't know, but I'm not doing it. Disrespectfully. Probably rolled his eyes the same time he did it. But then what he did later, he changed his mind and said. Actually, the word is repented. He repented of his disobedience and decided to go and work in the vineyard anyways. That was the first son. Goes from disobeying to then changing his mind, repenting, and then obeying. Second son says, I will, sir. Now the word sir is the word kiri, which is translated as in Greek, the word Lord. I will, Lord. I will do what you've asked me to do. You're the boss, applesauce. Dad, you want to work in the vineyard? Right on it, did he? No. He said he would, but he didn't. Why not? With the parables of Jesus, you have to be careful. It's usually the, he's trying to make a very simple point. We have to be careful we don't like try to read into things too much. But I wonder, like, if we just kind of play this out a little bit, was he like, was he distracted? Is that why? Like he was maybe planning to, but then something distracted him and he forgot. One of my kids walked into the room a couple weeks ago and did that thing, you know, why did I come in here? I find I do that a lot more as I'm getting old, and I just said, get used to it, buddy. <laughs> it's going to happen a lot more. Like, did the son just get distracted? Did he think maybe his father didn't mean it? Kind of like, eh, if you're bored today, maybe go on down there. You know, just a suggestion for what to do. 
Or was he just choosing? I'm just, my dad said this, I just don't feel like it. I'm just not going. Of course, it's a parable. We don't know exactly, but it's probably the last one. The truth is, it doesn't really matter, does it? Who obeyed their father? First one. Who disobeyed? Second one. See, what you say doesn't matter if it's not followed up with action. And even if you start down the wrong path, you can repent and go down the right path. Amen? That's what our whole faith is built on. I was a sinner. I was lost. And now I've come to Christ. And we know that there's never a point until you take your last breath where you can't repent and say, Okay, Lord, I am now going to obey you. I am now going to follow you. Hear that. We can always... If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Then we come to the rest of the parable. And this is where Jesus just, woo! I love Jesus' like, directness. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Wow. If Jesus had punched the chiefs in the face, they would not have been more offended than they were by his words. This is kind of what you might call a mic drop moment. And you know what that is? It's when you say something that's just like so powerful and true and then you just drop the microphone and walk away. That's really what Jesus does here. If that microphone's on, he might have done that. What, because what does he say? He says, well, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you, chief priests and, and teachers of the law, you who consider yourselves so righteous and holy. Tax collectors, like they were considered traitors to the Jewish people. Uh, they were conspiring with Rome, right? They're, they had divided allegiances. They were they were Jews in their birthright, but yet they were working with the evil, wicked Romans and stealing money from the people. Legally, the way it was in the Roman system, they could take as much money as they wanted from you, and they had Rome behind them. You know, you give me this because I say so. They were despised. And then prostitutes, let's be honest, women weren't very highly regarded in Jewish society in the first century anyways, and then those living in sexual sin were especially despised. The story in John chapter 8, when you know they bring the woman to Jesus who's been caught in adultery, you ever ask, like, where was the guy? Because like the law of Moses did say that the adulterers should be stoned, but it involved both two people, right? Where was the man? See, they didn't hate the man. They hated her. Jesus says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven. Not just entering the kingdom of heaven, that would have been offensive enough, but ahead of you. Like, they're, they're first in line. You're not even getting in the door. And what's amazing about this is where are they when Jesus tells this parable? It says that they're in the temple. They're, they're in the temple where the prostitutes and the tax collectors aren't allowed. The chief priests are very proud of the fact that they are allowed. And then there. Jesus says, you're not even getting in the kingdom of heaven. And they're ma making it in there ahead of you. And I'm saying this in the temple. And why? Because the chief priests, they're that first son. I'm sorry. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are like that first son of the parable. They started out their life and they're not honoring God in any way. But John the Baptist comes along and preaches repentance and then Jesus follows it up. The way of life has been opened up and they responded and they changed their mind. They repented and now they're following Christ. They have faith in Christ and so now they're in the kingdom of heaven. But the chief priests that second son says, yes, Lord, I will obey. And they do their prayers ten times a day, and they fast twice a week, and they, they do everything that they're supposed to do to be good Jewish people. But when the real way of righteousness is opened up before them, say, I'm not interested. They were happy when John the Baptist was killed, and now this week they're going to be obedience. 
They're the second son. They want no part of the salvation God brings. Because what you say means very little until you follow up with obedience. As Henry Blackaby says in Experiencing God, he says, when he gives you a command, you are not just to observe it, discuss it, or debate it. You are to obey it. It's not for interpretation, it's for obeying and see, sometimes we might be tempted to say, you know, God, just give me something big to do, like some big assignment. Who's thought that before? Give me some big, grand, glorious assignment to do. I will do anything you ask me to do, Lord. And I pray that if God asks us to do that, we would. We'd like to think that if God said, hey, we want you to go, I want you to go to Africa and preach, or I want you to go volunteer at this organization that you've you're working with a group of people you've never worked with before, and you're kind of nervous about it. Go do that thing. We'd like to think that we would say yes. But everything that God asks us to do is in the context of his relationship with us, right? And one thing I know our group is learning experiencing God, really just the, the importance of that personal day-to-day -day walk with Jesus. That's more important even than doing big things for God, because what he's really working on is our heart. He's more interested in molding us than he is in what he does through us. So before we are ready to say yes to the big things, we must obey God in the day to day. Like, I'm not worried about whether I'm going to Africa in five years right now. I need to walk with you today, Jesus, and obey what you're asking me to do today. Warren Worsby said, it is a basic principle of Christian living that we cannot learn new truth until we, or if we disobey, what God has already told us. We've got to obey what we know, what we've been told, and then God reveals new things. You know, Peter thought that he was ready for a big assignment at the Last Supper, didn't he? He thought he was ready for a big assignment. You remember what that assignment was? This is in uh, Luke 22. Verses 33 and 34. I'm going to actually start at verse 31. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he, Simon, replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Bring me the big assignment. I'm willing to go out in a blaze of glory for you, Jesus. I will obey no matter what. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Jesus is saying, look, man, you think that you're ready for that big assignment, you're ready to die for me? You can't even acknowledge me in a tough crowd. Now, Peter will die for Jesus eventually. But God's going to mold his character. It's going to be years before God says, okay, Peter, now's the day. So do we want... God, to use us in big ways. I hope so. And I believe God has big things he wants to do through us as individuals, as a church. I believe God is at work and he wants to use us in big ways. But the important thing, I think, is that we walk with Jesus today. What is the quality of your relationship with him today? And is God giving us small assignments he wants us to do today? And are we obeying those assignments? What's he calling you to do right now? What's he calling us to do right now? Have we obeyed in those small things? So if, if you feel like, that's one thing that you know, I've learned through this, is like those promptings that we may think are just random thoughts, like God prompts you to make a phone call. See how somebody's doing. Hasn't been in church recently. Or to write a letter or, or speak to a stranger. Right? I mean, that's, that, that can be one of the tougher things to do, right? There's somebody, I don't know them. God says, stop them. Oh, okay. Are we doing that? Are we following those promptings? Or have we given God permission to do those things through us? Or have we had an attitude that says, I'm just fine the way things are, Lord. Please don't ask me to leave this. It's comfortable. I like it. If it takes us out of that comfort zone or makes us afraid of failure, or it's beyond our experience, do we say, I'm going to shrink back? <clears throat> So I guess as we close today, I just want to ask a question. I think there's even a spot in the bulletin if you want to jot it down. If not, make one. What's one thing 
that you believe God wants you to do that you haven't done yet? One thing you believe God has asked you to do that you have not done yet. Maybe it's talking to a neighbor. Maybe restoring a, a broken relationship. Maybe it's having to go and apologize to somebody to make something right. Maybe it's a loving confrontation that you need to make. You need, you need to prayerfully approach somebody about something. Or maybe it's stepping into new ministry, volunteering somewhere, or starting something that God is calling you to do. Because if you've been ignoring what God has said, if you've been saying no, we can be like that first son and obey, right? We can change our mind. We can repent. Say, okay, Lord, I will do what you're asking me to do. And as a result, we'll come to know God better. We'll get into the habit of obeying step by step. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for this very short parable that's very impactful. Lord, how tragic it is for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and those chief priests. They said, they decided they were going to follow God. They made the decision, but then when it came right down to it, they, they didn't obey. And Lord, we know that for the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and so many others, including myself, we were on the wrong path and we said no to you. And then we said yes and said, I will follow Lord, what you'd really like for us to be, I mean, from this point of our life forward, is you'd like to maybe be that third son that Jesus didn't address uh, that said, I will go, and then he went. I will say I will go, and then I will follow it up. May that be our heart, Lord. May we be that third son that Jesus didn't describe. But we thank you, Lord, that every time we fall short, you're there to restore us and bring us back and show us your grace. As David said in Psalm 51, so we pray, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence and take, me, take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain Grant us a willing spirit to sustain us and lead us into new experiences of you. We can then lift our hands and say, God has done great things through us because we walk with him in obedience. That is our prayer today.